Thank you all for coming. I'm Jacqueline Tobin. I'm the editor of Rainfinder magazine. Does anyone get that magazine? <laughs> um, that's good to know. And you read it. <laughs> I just look at the photos. Uh, <laughs> so this is called 30 Rising Stars of Wedding Photography. So every year, Rainfinder does a competition of its 30 rising stars. And, you know, mostly this seminar is about, like, your first five years getting started, branding and marketing. Um, and then I'll talk about what we look for in a rising store and why that's important to us to like have this competition. But I just wanna first introduce my amazing panel. So this is Mantis Kubelinskis. He's a rising star 2017. Yes. He's still rising. <laughs> Kami Grudzinski, another rising star 2017. Kevin Mullins, who's a UK-based photographer. He's um, the, an, an official ambassador of Fujifilm. He's a great photojournalist, wedding photojournalist. And Blair DeLobenfels, um, a brand consultant. She was the founder of Junebug Weddings. She helps so many people with a lot of marketing advice. She's our branding expert. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Did, did I say something wrong, Blair? No. No, like, and also a really great friend. Okay. <laughs> so, I, and again, so I really want to thank our sponsors. So Fujifilm and Shoe Proof has sponsored the 30 Rising Stars for 2017. And we're really grateful for that. And it's just so important that companies and other photographers really, like, um, you know, just support us and what we're trying to do with the 30 Rising Stars. Um, so one thing, that was the cover from this year. Um, what happens with the 30 Rising Stars is we find people from all over the world who have established their signature voice, their authentic vision for like what they're trying to promote in their brand. And I feel like that's important because then you can connect with your clients more if you really have like established like what you want to shoot, then the people that you want to work for will come to you. Um, and so these, the people that we have in the lineup really like enforce that vision of being to themselves and their signature voice. So these were the names from this year. So again, Mantis and Cami were on that list. Um, so I get asked a lot like, you know, what do you look for when you're judging the submissions? And again, like we get about 250 or 300 portfolios and me and my staff look through everything, 30 images per person for about 250 people. Um, and we, you know, we're looking again for, is their submission, does it have consistency and flow? Does it tell me like who they are as a photographer? Um, as you all know, when you're editing your work, it's really hard to be your own editor. So we're also looking so that, to see that that submission is very cohesive. Um, so here's the five elements for me and my staff of what we look for. And this again would apply to like when, you're apply when you want to submit work to a blog or to a magazine. These are things that other photo editors look for. So for wedding photography, isn't it so important that you capture emotion, right? And you want it to be candid and real. Um, you can be a photojournalist like wedding photographer. You can be somebody who does more lifestyle or fashion. But again, I think like getting the emotion is really important. So we look for that, and it doesn't have to be so overt, but you are there to like pick up on things that somebody else might not. Um, so again, finding your voice, the consistency, editorial quality. We like to see like how's that image going to look on a page because it will be printed on a page. Um, or looking more editorial and just being connected to a story. Does it have a sense of humor? Not every single submission has to, but um, I don't know if you find this, Kevin, but a lot of our Brit like the entries from British photographers, they're sort of very quirky and offbeat, and that sort of, nobody will know this reference, but like a Benny Hill quality to some of them. <laughs> uh, so it's just like, again, like you don't have to have that sense of humor in your photography, but that's a style that if somebody has honed in on that, like then we see that throughout the entire submission. And also, so, Fearless experimentation. What are you doing to shoot 
a very common image in a different way. How do you do the ring shot? How do you do the dress? You know, if I tell you how many times I've seen a dress hanging from a tree, I just want to, you know, it's like, that's cool, but like, let's now move on and show it in a different way. Or I saw the dress once like on a mannequin and then it started to become, it just felt more humanized that way or just the ring through a crystal or something. I'm, I'm sure you all have experimented. So take common things and show them more uniquely in a way that matches up to your signature voice. Um, how many of you are like in your first five years of shooting? That's a good amount. Um, is everyone here a wedding photographer? Which again, if you're a wedding photographer, you're shooting everything. You know, you're a photojournalist, you're a food and still life photographer, you're, you're, you're doing fashion and lifestyle and everything. And so this esteemed panel did that now get into how they found their signature voice and how they branded themselves in a very oversaturated market. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly go through I picked some images from the from 2017's Rising Stars just to show you the points that I just went through of what I feel like these images illustrate those points. You know, you can do the dark and moody thing if that works for you and that's what your clients like to do or that's what they want. Um, Jeff Newsom, are you here, Jeff? He was here earlier. I really love his work and you know, he has this dark, moody, very fine art look, and that's the type of client he gets. And so he loves what he does because he's doing that style and getting the people who want that style. Um, here's a few more. I'll just go quickly through. Details are really important. When we're judging the submissions, we get a lot of entries that just are bride and groom, bride and groom, bride and groom, bride and groom on a mountain you know, bride and groom on an icy cliff. Like, I don't know how they get them there. But it's like, we wanna see the full range. And that's what photo editors wanna see if you wanna get on a blog or in a magazine. A full range of the getting ready, the ceremony, the details, everything that tells the story and like just weaves everything together. Here's some humor that I spoke about earlier. Okay, I love that. Almost done, okay. So again, these are the 30 rising stars from 2017, some examples. And so now, we're gonna have Mantis talk about how he got started. And what's important for Mantis, like as I spoke to him, it was really important for him to get established in his community, make connections. In the DC area, they have a very strong, uh, tight-knit community, Aram Rizvi, is one of the people that he connected with. So Mantis thought, you know, I want to be an A player working with other A players. So he decided to go out and find out who those really strong voices in the community were. And, and this is really important too. If you find those people and connect with them, they're, you know, you're all competing, but you also, if you have your own style, then you're not competing directly with them. So uh, Mantis will talk about the connections he made and how he second, did second shooting for some of his people who he really admired and how that launched him. And there's one image that he talks about that launched his entire career. So do you want me to put that yeah. up? Hello. Okay. Is this, is this for us? Hello? Oh. Hi. Hi guys. So, oh, so I need to be that close, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I wanna talk about this image, specific this image, because that shot, which I did uh, in my early, early stage of my photography, uh, changed my entire vision about uh, photography and about everything. You know, like once you're starting to do something, let's say once, you once you're starting to be a photographer, uh, first you shoot everything, whatever you can, you know, what is, you know, trees, buildings, uh, squirrels, and, you know, that's what we do. And one day I was walking through DC and I just was taking some shots and I took this one. So after I was looking at it, I realized that I really, really like uh, people and I really love images with action. So that's what, what I realized uh, that I want to work with people and, you know, I want to uh, be a wedding photographer because it's a perfect place to capture amazing moments. 
But what were you shooting right before then? Were you doing like... Oh, I was, I was shooting squirrels. I, okay. <laughs> How about squirrel <laughs> weddings? That would be cute. You know, it, it took me a few <laughs> years to realize what I want to do. So that okay. after so this... So then shot, once you realized that and yeah. you knew like the look and the voice you wanted to project out so, there, yeah, uh, then, what was your pathway after so that? So then I started to, you know, take pictures. You know, I started to develop my website. I started to do weddings. And I realized that I'm, you know, I'm kind of feeling good, but I'm doing not something wrong. So and one day I met Erm Rizve. She's here, by the way, uh, at the, I don't know, at the workshop or somewhere. I don't know. It, it was some workshop. And before that, I read uh, Steve Jobs' book, which was mentioning that A players should be playing with A players. So I, I met her, and I was like, hey, Erm, I'm going to work for you. I'm going to pay you. I want to be your second photographer. So that's how he said that he would pay her to work with her. <laughs> yeah. That's a really important like point to make. So that that was my <laughs> Crazy, you know but real. yeah, but that's how no, I wanted I to be a photographer. Admirable. So that right. I wanted to be wedding photographer so bad, and she accepted me. You accepted his money. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and then I started to do my you know weddings, and we worked with Aaron for a long time, for a year, maybe two, I don't know, and I've been a second photographer. So here's her. some more. I'm just showing a few more of your images. These are more recent ones than what we saw in the 30 and submission. The, so and um, one thing what I learned about it that um, you know whatever you guys do, just uh, make sure that you take care of uh, reading books and um, learning all basics. And so once you know all basics, and you know then you can start to experiment. So that's where you know what you need to do. Not do not look at you know all blogs and just. You know, so many people lose uh, their minds once they follow other photographers, but just follow yourself and just read more books, learn new things, and you're going to be, you know, different. Well, so, Mantis, when you um, submitted your work, I remember I was struck by, and I forgot to mention, so Mantis, um, to be a rising star, you get nominated by people in the industry. So, he was nominated three times, and I think. It took three times for him to get the distinction of it. And I'm bringing that up because, you know, I kept saying to him, like, I see something in your work, but you need to evolve it and just hone in your vision more and your voice more. And so the work that we saw, it was all um, black and white entries that had that, like, more photo J style, more, um, like, very graphic and compositional and very just very strong. And it's funny that some of the early work, or some of the more recent work now that you're doing, is more, it's more color and looks a little more lifestyle-y, but still maintains your, that look that we saw in your submission. Yes. So, you know, when you're pitching yourself to clients or you're showing work, are you showing a mix of like what we saw, the black and white, very more graphic and edgier with the more lifestyle work? Do so you mix they, everything? Literally, whatever my clients, whatever they see, that's book me, so I show a mixture of black and white and colors, but I get a lot of good comments about, uh, you know, most of my clients love black and white, what, you know, how I do that. But so, do, and, you're, and Blair will talk later about, like, having a really oh. cohesive portfolio, but, like, Mantis, do you, you know, do you have a book or a website that has everything mixed in yes. together? Uh, yes, everything is on my website, I, yeah. Right. Can you? Okay, and so okay. also... Okay. Awesome. Um, you know, you were telling me about inspiration. Do you said that well, you have an inspiration board that yeah, you go to? Yeah. So to get? another thing, uh, most of the time before wedding, um, it's a it's a big. I'm gonna show that later. I have my inspiration board, which just inspires me and makes me cry. And you know, if you want to get more details about it, email me. I'm gonna explain you what that means for me. But uh, it's uh, at the end of the slideshow, and I look inspiration not through wedding images, but through you know a lot of life experiences, which is you know, um, yeah. Once you're gonna see, go, go go to my website and check that out, and then you're gonna you know then you're gonna see what I'm looking for inspiration. So, um, you know, when you talked about meeting Aram and Leah, doing a lot of second shooting in the beginning of your career. Um, so what was like after that, like how did you go from that to then becoming, you know, having your own business 
and being successful and like getting the types of clients like what was your pathway did you you know did you how did you market yourself did you get a website right away did you have a blog did you so was it word of mouth that you were getting so hired? honestly like um when i was working with Aaron, i worked with leah hewitt she was a rising star as well so they allowed me to use some images for my blogs and for my portfolio so that's why that's so, how i i, I I was second shooting. In the meantime, I, I was able to show those images. Okay, so he so, built up his yeah. portfolio by doing second shooting with like, you know, with other the, people in the community that he worked yeah. with. And so, would you, when you put these images up on the, on your website, like? So another thing, what I find out, I was I made website by myself, which was looking terrible, and uh, one of my clients built website for me as a as a gift because I did their wedding. Right. So. After that, uh, my business shift, because it was quality website, it looks that looked amazing, and my blog was there, and everything was there, good images. And another secret uh, I'm gonna share with you, uh, so Yelp was my Kickstarter. Yelp? Yel Yelp.com, so that's where I got a lot of clients, because of good reviews and, you know, so it's, did you ask clients to go on and give you good reviews? Of course. Like, right. Yeah. And so that helped to, That helped right. me to, to build better portfolio, find amazing clients. Like 90% of those images which you see came from Yelp. So that, that was my secret to, being, to getting amazing, you know, amazing clients. Okay, and just one last question for you, sure. and later people can ask questions of the panelists. Um, so like I said earlier that you entered the 30 Rising Star three times. And I told you to hang in there, like, you know, why was it important? You know, th like, it's really not about the rising stars, but it's about, like, really getting your brand and name out there. And everybody enters contests and competitions, I'm sure, you know, and you're doing it more for you. And, as, you know, I don't know that brides look at it as much, but it's nice to put something on your website that says you're awarded by such and such. But why was it important to you to enter a competition like that and ha does that help your brand in any way or has it so it's most important to speak oh, oh sorry yeah that microphone <laughs> project oops <laughs> um, it's a it's really important to you know for me it was really important to show my work for other photographers um to you know my one of my goals to become educators so that's why for me it, it was more right. most important just to show show up in this community and in the last six or eight months, you said that, I don't know if it's because of the rising stars, but you said that you've been getting hired so much more by foreign clients or people from around the world and getting a lot of requests yeah, mom, for yeah. destination weddings, right? Yeah, like I'm doing this in a lot of destination wedding now. Right. I, I'm not sure how, but uh, uh, of course. They're each but again, just helping. keeping your name out there, um, you know, through through blogs and magazines and meeting and networking and coming to places like this too. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the key okay. to success. Cool. My, yeah. um, all right, well thank you, we'll get back to you later. No um, problem, thank so you. So Cami is also a rising star of 2017 and I wanted her here because they have very different looks. Um, and Cami, uh, like tell me if I'm wrong, but like I think that you have a more, your images are a little more classical and traditional and they look a little more in the framework of like WPPI print comp, um, but they're also very timeless. And so Cami started out as a Disney park photographer, shooting 600 families a day. And she'll tell you like how like she launched her career after that. Um, but so she's also like out of the gate, went from like zero to shooting like 60 weddings a year. So she's a high volume shooter. So thank you, Cami. So just let it tell us a little bit about how you Absolutely. got started and launched your career. Well, thank you everyone for being here. This is really exciting. Um, Disney played a huge role in my career because I started shooting parks. And um, at Disney, they teach you to excel in customer service and experience, like delivering client experience, right? Well, at Disney, we call it guests, right? Um, it's so important to focus on the client. I brought that to weddings with me to focus on my couple, right? It's not, it wasn't about me, it was about my couple. Um, at Disney, um, after I shot the parks for a couple of years, I learned about many different photography departments inside Disney, including weddings. So I had the opportunity to 
um, become a wedding assistant, so carrying the lights, and also a second shoot. So when I started as an assistant, I had no idea where to put a light. But on that first year, I assisted hundreds of weddings. Um, I have, there's another uh, wedding photographer from Disney here, Courtney. Uh, we shoot, it's hundreds, so every day, you, you, you get experience so fast. So I learned that from 600 families or hundreds of weddings a year that I could build experience really fast. Um, some, one photographer inside Disney said that my personality would probably be really good for weddings, and I decided to shoot my first wedding with her outside. When I shot that very first wedding, I fell in love with it. I think being surrounded by people, by family, it was just so much love. I wanted more of that. So on that very first year, uh, I got uh, to shoot under 10 different wedding photographers now outside Disney. And I decided to open my business. So it was really quick. But let me just quickly ask, how did you find those, those 10 people you liked their work and just went to them and said, hey, I want to shoot for you? Like, how did you do that? Some of them I was working under them, like as an assistant right. at Disney, and some of them uh, outside Googling and emailing them and say, hey, I want to work, I want to assist, I'm going to carry your boxes, I'll do whatever it takes because I want to learn. So how long did you do that before you then launched your like, solo career? Probably three, four months. Wow. <laughs> and and I, now you've been shooting for what, three years? Or so four? three years, okay. yeah. Um, so um, right after I had that... Um, the courage to open my business. I actually opened my business under my name, Kami Grudzinski Fine Art Photography. And it started, you know, like, a, it started okay. It was a Craigslist based type of thing, I think like many people start. Um, and uh, for, the photographers at Disney told me the importance of investing in education, WPPI and workshops. And I decided to take Jerry Gionis workshop, a five day workshop that there was something really, really crucial for the change of my business. Jerry said that the name of my business didn't match my personality. He's like, you're not gonna attract the right client with this name. Kemi Grudzinski, fine art photographer, sounds like, he said that I sounded like a angry <laughs> Polish lady. So he's like, no, so you. Uh, so they changed it. Yeah, so he's like, you're so bubbly, you shouldn't do that. So basically what he did, he closed his eyes and he, just, he drew Kemi Z. And I cried because I had put so much money in business cards and website, and now I had to change everything. He said I needed a new website, a new look. I needed cohesive colors and all of that, like the branding. Right. I changed everything. According to his advice, I trusted him. My business pretty much doubled from that advice, just from having the right name, the right domain, the right colors. It was insane. And, and with Jerry recently wrote an article in Rangefinder about naming your business. And then if you do your own name, I mean, this, this doesn't apply to everybody, but then what if you want to sell your business later on? Or it's just the name is very, very important to think about. So Kami Z is catchier and shorter and easier to say. Mantis Kubelinska is not as much, but, but in your case, it didn't matter as much. And so again, like here you are at WPPI and we're all giving such a lot of advice and you're gonna hear a lot of like conflicting advice as you go along. And what you have to do is like take the information and apply it. How does it apply to you in your business? You know, and that's part of the learning process as well. Um, but so I think like the most important voice is like, what's your persona? What's the, your vision that you want to project to your clients? And that's how each of them then like started their businesses. So then once you, you changed the name, so you had to go off and like get all new business cards and branding, yep. right? Um, and then what, did you have a website up already by then? I, well, I had that website on the old name, well, right. the real name. So I had to change. But I think once I took those workshops, I saw the value of education. I decided that every single penny that I was making, I would reinvest in education. That, um, that itself was the, probably the second most important decision I've made. And I am investing edu in education to this day. Like tomorrow my day is full of classes. So the workshops plus WPPI attending the print competition right. has defined my work. I think everybody that's starting and then it's getting the camera and it's shooting a lot of natural light, a lot of emotion, a lot of expressions. 
but what else can you do? What else can you make you stand out? Like, what else can you put on your portfolio, on your image, on your Instagram that's going to make people actually stop from scrolling and look at your work? Um, the Knot has been pretty big for my business. And I, I went before advertising on The Knot, I decided to open that page and look what everybody else had posted to, and post as my front image something completely different. Right. So instead of just following what everybody else was doing, I decided to stick to my guts and do my own thing. That's great. I decided that on my social media and everything, I wanted to showcase what I wanted to sell. I didn't want to look and anybody else around me was doing, I wanted to see what can I do that, that I can do that's different than everybody. Um, I ended up falling in love with lighting. I love um, uh, flash, I love, I carry actually three lights usually uh, on the wedding day at all times. Whoever works with me kind of hates me because they have to carry that and it's hard of course, but it makes my work stand out. So even on a situation where I could be shooting with natural light, I want to make sure, what could I do different? I arrive at a venue and I try to say, what can I do different it, 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 that's not, someone is not going to see? And I think that's what makes people stop. Right. But also, you reminded me that a little anecdote I forgot to mention in the beginning is that, um, you know, while you're all here and you see other people's work and you get inspired by their work, I had met one girl who, she was just starting out as a wedding photographer and she really couldn't find her voice and she had really pretty images, but like I couldn't connect to them as a viewer. I felt sort of distant when I looked at them and they were, they were fine images, but they weren't like standout. They weren't amazing. I wouldn't have hired her if I was looking to hire a wedding photographer. And so she asked for advice and I said, just do me a favor, um, stop looking at people's blogs and websites for two weeks. Don't look at any photographer's work, like watch movies or read books, but don't look at any wedding photographer's work for two weeks, just disconnect completely. Because she was really getting very like overwhelmed by seeing all the couples on the mountainside or um, like a little figurine couple in a grand sweeping panoramic type of scene. And then I said in a month or two months, come back to me and show me some new work. And when she did, she said, you know, it was amazing that I just stopped looking and getting so overwhelmed with every, oh, I should be doing this, I should be doing this. And then it helped her really like hone in on her signature voice and the work was just so much stronger. And so, you know, I feel like you, Cami, you know, you go to classes to get more educated, to get more inspired. I think the real like message is inspiration versus imitation. And so you can look at other people's work and see what's the trend out there, but also like, make it more authentic to you. And so you were inspired, I mean, you were inspired by Jerry and people like that, right, Jerry Guiones. Um, what uh, like outside sources do you go to for inspiration? Like, do you like movies or, you know, go to museums or like what else inspires your work besides other photographers? I actually love following filmmakers uh, on Instagram. So instead of following wedding photographers on Instagram, I follow filmmakers. I think the way filmmakers translate uh, a message through color and light, it's kind of insane. So um, whenever I'm editing, instead of um, watching anything uh, like a show or something, I, put, um, I will put um, shows even from different countries or movies and I turn off the sound so I can be editing and if I take a, a quick look to the side and I love what I see, sometimes I just take a quick screenshot. So the more you look at wedding photographers, what's going to happen, you don't even realize it, but you're going to end up emulating that work. Like it's almost like subconscious. So if you guys want to create something that stands out and it's different, stop looking at the wedding photographer's work, mainly people that are local to you. If you want to follow wedding photographers, maybe follow someone that's on the opposite side of the world, where they are doing different cultures. Try to try to not look at what everybody else in your area is doing. Um, and also like, so this image here, which when I was talking earlier about like a dress from a tree, <laughs> like the, what I like about this image, that it's also, it's a different way of showing the dress. Um, it's a great graphic scene, but also it like gives the sense of like creating, setting the location, like the, the place or the venue, like setting the venue of that's part of the story. So did they get married somewhere in here or, you know, so like look at your location and where you're at, you're telling a story. So you want like, maybe this setting was um, special to the bride and groom, I don't know their backstory. Um, but like what, 
how did you, like, where is this, first of all? And That's a Disney cruise line, well, like a Disney cruise ship. So that was the Disney cruise wedding. Um, I wanted to make sure I could capture that to have absolutely show the location because they invested, that's what they wanted. They wanted the ship, right? right. So I, w I woke up about five in the morning so I could get <laughs> no one in the atrium, <laughs> no one there, and execute the shot for them. Um, and so also, like, when we were talking before this, you were saying how when you... Once you established yourself and you got, you had put up a new website, right? And then doubled your business. So is that part of when you had your name change and all of that? Yes, Because yes. immediately you just started like doubling your bookings. Like how did that work? So what happened was when I um, opened the, on Facebook and social media, and I think people got curious on the sense of what did she do in changing her name, right. started clicking on the website and also started sharing. So whenever you, um, I started sharing images under that new name, for some reason, magical reason that Jerry's know the secret, people started actually clicking and following more. That was on the, uh, on your website, you're saying? On the so both website and social media, because once I changed my right. name, I had to change across the board, right? So do you rely on social media a lot? Like, are you Instagramming every day? Like, how do you, what do you do, like, to keep your, every, you know, I know people, photographers are doing, they're posting on Instagram every single day. Do you do that at all? Or do you rely more on Facebook or not really social media as much? No, I'm not, I don't post every day. I actually don't follow any of the rules that I read about because uh, shooting 60 weddings a year, there's not a lot of time for that. Right. It's kind of a lot on the back end. But um, I do believe um, that when I share there's, okay, there's something really cool, guys, that you guys can do if you want to build more traffic to your website. Whenever you post an image on social media, write that down. Instead of just putting the image on Facebook, which I do that when I don't have time, the right way to do is actually post on your website first. Uh, add all the, the inf good information on the photo first, your metadata, your words, your keywords, everything. You get the image, post on your website first, and then you share on social media. So basically, every time someone clicks on that image, they're going to go to your website. And but that, that's really important, because I know a lot of people who just do it on their Instagram yes. page and or their Facebook. Sometimes I do. I make tons of mistakes. It's busy. You know, like, it's crazy. But the thing is, if you do that, you're generating more traffic to your website. And guess what? People are not going to look at that image only. They're going to browse through. And then when that's helping you build your SEO. So everything right. is connected. So if you can do that and pay attention to get your image posted on your website first, so pick, the, pick one. Instead of maybe putting like the whole wedding preview, 15, 20, pick one. Pick your one strongest shot. Pick the shot that translates your work more. Like what do you want to sell? What do you want to attract? Get that one shot. What do you like to do? Put on your website first and then you get the link and put on your social media. You know, and sometimes it's really hard to be your own editor and to figure out what is your one best shot. Um, I know with the 30 Rising Star submissions, a lot of people, like, ask their friends to look at their work. Um, you know, it's just easier, like, if you remove yourself and ask for advice. Every photographer I know has, like, so many other photographer friends who are doing the same thing, and they, you know, I know a lot of them will be very, like, honest and say, no, this, this is terrible, take that out, because you also have to think about the message that you're sending. So when you, Mantis, put your book together three times to submit to a competition, the Rising Stars, like what, did you keep taking out work each time? Like how did you curate that selection? How did you pick your own best shots? Did you have help? Um, honestly, whatever I do, I'm trying to do by myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like uh, uh, first, uh, Aram was helping me out. Uh, I think so in my first or second year. And Aram is also a rising star from a couple of years ago. <laughs> so she was she was helping me out a lot. And uh, but last one, I I just I just did by myself. I just. But that one was it. very different from the work that you're like the more recent work. It was all very again. I said before, like black and white and edgier a little moodier, um, what made you think like that was going to be the formula? 
Your like what <laughs> my advice your what advice what was the message that you want like but you're not even shooting that work anymore so i'm just trying to like show people so that you could also have so different voices and different styles so once you submit for anything you need to take a look at your own images because first year i submit i did mix mash whatever i found you know it was color black and white and my uh, my black and white uh, it's standing out way better than color and this year, you know, I just submit just black and whites because it looked amazing. If I add some color images, it doesn't, you know, my work wasn't standing out. It would look too disjointed. Yeah, it was, it was like just mixed mesh. So when you have clients come to you, like, so do they, like, book you through your website or call you or do you show Honestly, them? They see your website first? Honestly, my social media, I... You know, I, I take care of my social media, but I notice that everything comes through a website. I, I, Instagram doesn't work for me. For some people, it works for me not. Uh, my blog does magic. Uh, I'm on Google on first pages somehow because I, if I do blogging, I'm trying to do, to do storytelling. So let's say I add 20 images and tag whatever I can to tag. And most of the time, you know, when you're looking for a venue or something, your work is just showing up. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We'll take more questions later. Okay. Um, thank you, Cami. Um, so next in the lineup is Kevin Mullins. So Kevin's um, a British photographer. He is an official Fujifilm ambassador. He is, has a very photojournalistic style, um, which I feel is again, a more timeless, like, documentary look. So he's going to talk a little bit about... So he's been shooting for 10 years, right? About 10 years? About so he's that, just going to yeah. tell you about, you know, how he got started and um, working with vendors or how do you get, like, a sponsor or how do you, like... How did you become the, an ambassador? But just talk about, like, where, you're, where you started out 10 years ago and how you've propelled yourself forward. Okay. Um... Firstly, I feel about 200 years old sitting next to you guys. <laughs> Not me, I'm <laughs> no, no, older no, no. than you. Yeah, like, I've seen all this amazing work, it's brilliant to see. Um, yeah, so my story is a little bit different, I think, in that I, 10 years ago, yeah, 10 years ago this year, um, I was not a photographer, I didn't own a camera, I never owned a camera, I had no ambition to be a photographer whatsoever. Um, I was doing a regular kind of nine to five job, and I was commuting five hours every day, uh, two and a half hours each way, every single day. And uh, I just got burnt out, completely burnt out. And I sat on a train one day, a tube, and I picked up one of the free magazines that you get on the tube. Um, and I, so somebody had just left it there. I picked it up and I read this story. And it was an interview with um, a wedding photographer called Jeff Askoff, um, who some of you probably have heard of. Um, and actually, it wasn't an interview. It was just some of his pictures were, were in this article. And I was looking at these pictures, and I thought, oh, wow, these are great. I really like this. You know, like my, my understanding of a wedding photographer back then was this bossy guy that would just turn up and stand on a stepladder and tell everybody what to do and, you know, dress like a ninja and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, so I went home to my wife that day, and I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to become a wedding photographer. <laughs> And she was. She, said, oh, she was like, uh, yeah. So we, she had like a three-month-old baby under her arm, and she was like, well, um, a couple of things. Um, one, you don't own a camera, and two, you're really quite miserable, and I don't think you'd be very good at it. Um, and whether I was very good at it, I don't know. But I've done like 450 weddings since. So, so my my kind of um, <laughs> epiphany, if you like, was this idea that. Like, now I'm 10 years down the line, and I hope that some of you guys who are new or certainly starting out in the first few years never lose sight of the fact that you come into this industry um, through a kind of vocation, if you like. Now, I bet if I... I'll ask this question. Hands up if when you left high school, you thought, I want to be a wedding photographer. Nobody. Wow. Nobody, right? You might have wanted to be a music photographer or an editorial photographer or fashion photographer. Nobody wants to leave school and become a wedding photographer, right? You know, that's, that's not trendy or fashionable. We know it is, but when you're in school, you don't think that. So this idea that you become a wedding photographer is based on the fact that you wanted to become a wedding photographer. You either fell into it because you photographed a friend's wedding or, you know, you, you, somebody said to you, you've got a nice camera, you can take pictures at my wedding. And then you, found, you, know, you enjoyed it and, it, you know, 450 weddings later, here you go. So, you know, one of the things that I'm very 
uh, conscious of now, like as I'm kind of heading into 10 years or so of this, is that I never lose fact of the, I never lose sight of the fact that I have to keep enjoying it. Now this comes back to the style that I shoot, which is um, entirely photojournalistic. I shoot mostly JPEG. My my kind of um, business model is based on having as much time with the family and kind of out of the business as much as possible. So, uh, you know, my workflow, my editing is is very quick and very. Um, it's very narrow, so you know I'll shoot the wedding and I'll edit it very quickly. I don't really do any kind of post-production. I prefer to shoot as much black and white as possible. In fact, I will give my clients a discount if they want 100% black and white because wow. it makes my life a lot easier, um, saves me a lot of time, and then I can go to play with my kids in the park or something like that. Um, but really, the, this, this idea of um, being a wedding photographer, we all come back from weddings thinking, Ah, oh, you know what? That was hard. That I really, I don't know, you know. And I did my first wedding. And I wanted to be, I wanted to be just like Jeff Askoff, right? Um, and I went to my first wedding, and they wanted 41 group shots. And I was like, 41 group shots? This isn't what we, do. you know, this isn't wedding photojournalism. Um, and so, you know, I sat down with my wife at the end of that first year. I shot eight weddings in that first year. And, uh, you know, my wife is the most intelligent person in our business. And she basically said, right, so, well, what worked and what didn't work? And I was like, well, I kept coming back from these weddings doing all this stuff I didn't really want to do. She was like, right, well, stop doing that. Uh, you know, do it on your own uh, terms. And if it doesn't work, go back to the day job, go back to your five-hour commute, go back to, you know, earning them more money or whatever it was. Um, but sensibly, we kind of just decided there and then to do it. Um, in the way that I enjoyed it. And so, you know, of course, I still come back from some weddings thinking, oh, man, that was, you know, it wasn't so good or it was hard work. But by and large, I come back thinking, I really enjoyed that. And when I'm looking for pictures, I'm looking for kind of emotion and humanity and uh, intimacy between people. But it's 100% candid, so nothing is staged or set up. And that's part of my brand and my attraction uh, or the people I try and attract are people that will lend themselves to that. Um, and so, you know, my website and everything is built to attract those people as much as it is to push away the people that want something very different. Um, because there are, you know, for every one of me, there are 10, 20, 30, 40 other wedding photographers who can do stuff a lot better. Uh, the flash work, for example, and the more formal photography, you know, I will refer people on to those if they want it. It's, it's very important to just enjoy working, doing the job, I think. But you had mentioned to me that like your website is as much, and you had just said this, as much about attracting people as pushing them away. <laughs> so, so on your website, is it? It's all like black and white, and it's all exactly like the type of. It's looks yeah. It's that you all want people to hire you for. It's mostly black and white. Um, so I, you know, I learned uh, several years ago that if when you just put black and white entirely on the website, it pushes away everybody, almost everybody. So, uh, you know, that's not the greatest, the, the greatest thing that I can do. But it's, yeah, I would say kind of 75% of it is black and white, the images. The very first thing they do when they hit my website is there's a little slideshow and it's just 25 pictures. They are all black and white. They are all candid. They are all kind of uh, based on the idea of light composition and moment. And I essentially say to them, right, press play, watch this. Uh, if you enjoy it, explore the rest of the website. If you don't, go away, go somewhere else. Um, but do you feel like you did that in the first <laughs> year? Like, could you afford to, to tell people, no, I don't want to be hired? But you, you know, when you're starting out, you want, yeah. you need to like make money. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you deal with that? Because I've said it before, where like, don't take every single client if it doesn't match your voice. But in the beginning, you have to obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, in your first year. Did you start out right out of the gate with this very distinct style? Um, pretty close, yeah. I mean, I like I said, the very first wedding I did 41 group shots. Um, but the second year, that second year, I shot 71 weddings, which was just like complete hell for me. It was way too much. It was, you know, I wasn't charging enough. Um, the clients were slipping through the net that I didn't really want. And, you know, so it become uncomfortable. It become, you remember this idea of the vocation and it became you know, untenable. And so I then started really redefining the website and redefining the branding and making sure that there is, you know, there is nothing on my website that people can't find the information for. If anybody ever sends me an email and says, you know, ask me a question, 
and it's not something that's been answered on my website, I'll go to my website and put that information on there. Um, you know, to that end, I, I very rarely even meet clients before the wedding because, you know, they occasionally they'll, they'll want to meet me to just, you know, make sure I exist and just say hello kind of thing. And they'll, they'll travel up from London, they'll sit on my couch and they'll say, I'll say, right, you got any questions? And they'll be like, mm, not really. You know, we just wanted to, you know, meet you kind of thing, which is fine. I get that. Um, but really, the whole point is that, you know, my website is entirely geared towards attracting the right kind of people um, as much as pushing them away. Because as much as they, I don't want them to waste my time, I don't want to waste their time. You know, there are, there are other photographers out there that will, will deal with that, you know, better than I can in terms of the shooting style. Like how many, um, do you have, I go to um, websites where there's multiple galleries, like do you just have, or how many weddings do you have posted like on your homepage? Are there three or four? Do you have how many images in each gallery? If you so have? on the homepage, I have the 25 images. Um, and then towards the bottom, I have my kind of recent blog posts. I have a section for featured weddings, which is basically blog posts that, you know, I want people to, you know, they see the word featured and they'll go and look at that and they will kind of explore that probably. And when I look at my web stats, they look at the featured weddings before the blog. You know, mm -hmm. the featured wedding section is more popular than the blog section. So that's the way of keeping the, the, you know, the good weddings, the popular weddings, rippling to the top on the website. So I'll do that, and I will blog almost every wedding that I shoot. I'll blog almost every single one of them. Um, you know, and I kind of, uh, I think it's important to be proud of your own work. And at the same time, what you don't want to be doing is, uh, you know, worrying what other photographers are thinking. Right. You know, there's a lot of people that I think struggle with that, and they, they worry about putting their own content online, their own stuff, on, especially on social media. Um, and, you know, other photographers aren't our clients. It's, it's your clients, you know, the people who are going to pay you to shoot their wedding. And, and you were telling me, you know, that you, you attract a more, I'll, I don't know if this is the right word, but a more mature clientele or people who've been married before, right, or like a little bit mm -hmm. older. Um, was that also purposeful or is that part of like they saw your, the people that see your style just happen to be like older yeah. folks? I don't know. Yeah, no, it's not purposeful. Married five times. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I did one wedding. He was a lawyer. He'd been married six times and the lady he was marrying, it was her fifth wedding. Wow. And it was like all these kids there from all these various and they were like, so your John, was, was your dad Bill or Steve? Which, which, where did you come into it? So it was like five or six. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, not intentionally at all, but I think the kind of clients that often come to me are um, a little older, sometimes been married before. Um, I think crucially they're not pegged to their parents' income. So their parents aren't paying for the wedding. And their parents, especially in the UK, I'm not so sure about here, but in the UK, uh, generationally, the parents expect a very traditional wedding photographer, lots of group shots, lots of form stuff, pictures with the priests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and because they're not paying for it, or the parents aren't paying for it, they're no longer involved in this whole decision-making process, then the people can choose whom they wish and the style they wish. Uh, you know, whether that's somebody like me or whether it's somebody like Cami, then, you know, it's irrelevant. But they are not being tied down to the influences of their of their parents. So I think that kind of ripples through, and it's certainly not intentional, but I just think it's uh, it's part of the um, the attraction of the, the kind of documentary style. And you were telling me about like the language on your website, or like, do you use, you don't use social media that much, or your wording is very like carefully thought out, right? Um, about how you present yourself on your website, or when you use social media, you don't really use Instagram that much. I do, I do use Instagram, I do use it quite a lot, and I get I get quite a lot of bookings through Instagram, but yeah, I mean, from a language point of view, uh, you know, I've got, I don't have much hair up there. My, my hair down here is very gray, so I, I don't say things like, you know, smashed it and awesome that often. Uh, you know, I leave that up to the people who are smashing it and, say, and doing things awesome. So yeah, I think that, you know, from a kind of, just a communication point of view with the types of people that will possibly be, uh, you know, looking for me to shoot their wedding. Now, remember that part of my marketing and my branding is this idea of being very observational, very sympathetic to the wedding, very fly on the wall. I'm going to let people have their wedding day without any interference whatsoever from me. I'm not, what, not at any point will I ask them to do something, look this way, stand here, move into the light, say cheese, any of that. So, you know, they are people that really just want to have spent time entirely with their friends and family. Um, and just have the photographs that tell the story of that day without any kind of obligation to make those pictures happen. 
Um, now, like I said, and, and of course, what you're, you're seeing is lots of different styles of photography right the way throughout WPPI. And you know, wedding PJ is just one style. Um, it certainly doesn't mean it's the right style, and it's definitely not the only style. So what about like what you offer as products? Like, do you sell a lot of albums? Do you do the albums yourself? Do you sell a lot of larger wall art and things like that? Or yeah, so albums, they all, pretty much everybody will have an album. Um, if they don't have an album, they will get um, 30 10 by 8 prints as a gift from me. Um, so I insist that they have prints of some kind at least, but 95% of them will, will take the album option. Um, wall art, no. It's, it's very interesting because, uh, you know, there are no kind of, you know, dramatic portraits. There are no kind of lots of big group shots. So people typically don't buy wall arts of, mm -hmm. of themselves kind of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> laughing or, there. you know, yeah. whatever, or the speeches, <laughs> etc. It just doesn't seem to happen. So, so, yeah, I mean, that's a negative element of this kind of style of shooting. Um, but albums, definitely, yeah. Yeah. And one thing more that I want to ask you, Kevin, is so like you're the an unofficial ambassador of Fujifilm, but you know how did you create? You know how do you get like to start a relationship with a, a sponsor or a vendor? I think one thing I would say is I get a lot of emails, like a lot of emails from people who are basically saying, "How do I become a Fujifilm ex photographer and ambassador? How do I get free cameras?" And you know, <laughs> and uh, and you know, I have to pay for my cameras still. Right. Um, so the answer to that is you don't. Yeah. <laughs> but, the, you know, the answer to the how do you become a Fujifilm ambassador or an ambassador for anybody is just bloody hard work. You know, there's no easy routes. There's no right, shortcuts. It doesn't have to be Fuji, but just my point of, like, yeah, working yeah, absolutely. not only with anybody. other photographers, but creating, you know, relationships with other with vendors and just keeping your name out there. Yeah. And then you probably go around and speak for them. You were speaking in their booth earlier, right? Yeah, I was. Um, and it's, a, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship. We, you know, I, I, I help them. I've been involved in a couple of the camera designs and, you know, the, they, I've been to Japan and talked to the engineers and things like that, which is an, an amazing thing to happen. Um, but at the same time, what I didn't do is chase it. I didn't kind of chase them. I worked hard, I kind of continue to, you know, remember always that my clients are the people that are paying for me. They're the ones that are feeding me and my children and my wife. Um, so this idea of kind of the, the ambassadorial stuff, I mean, it's great, of course it's great, and you should try and, uh, you know, engage with brands, but I do honestly believe that it's more about, you know, publicizing your work with their stuff rather than trying to get easy shortcuts and trying to jump the queue and trying to kind of like, you know, hey, I've got 30,000 followers on Instagram, how do I become an ambassador? It's like, I don't know, you know what? You need, to, you need to have been using their stuff for a long time and you need, to, you, know, you need to kind of engage with them properly rather than just want to go to the front of the queue. Right, I mean, a lot of photographers also get so wrapped up in like using social media or they have to post every day and how, how many followers do I have? And then, you know, you have to remember that you're also running a business mm -hmm. and like you want to like, Pay attention to your clients. I, I mean, I don't know, Mantis. For you, 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 you are. I mean, are you very present on social media? You, you don't really look at any of that, right? No, no, no. I'm sorry. How many yeah. followers do you have? Two thousand. A thousand. Two thousand, <laughs> okay. probably. Yeah, right. I'm really bad on social media. Okay. So, yeah, and I, you, Cami? Do you? I, like I tried, but it doesn't less, work. Less than two thousand. I don't have any followers. Um, <laughs> Um, so, all right, thank you, Kevin, and I'm saving Blair for the end because she's our expert on branding and marketing. She's a brand consultant. She has so much experience, uh, but I just quickly want to do something before I get to Blair, which is ask, does anyone have questions for these three, like before we move on to the, where Blair gets into the nuts and bolts of like doing your website and doing your portfolio and like how do you pace it and being an editor of your work. I mean, she'll give examples, but does anybody want to ask any of these three any questions before we go on or did we not address something that you want addressed? Nobody. Okay, here we go. So there was a light uh, um, on that level, so to the right side. So basically, I was across the atrium, and the light. See if I can find it. Sorry, we're still on Kevin. Hang on one second. Yep. Did I just pass it? Okay. So you see that level where the dress is hanging? 
if you look to your right side, the light was on that side, hiding behind the second pillar here. So I didn't even have to Photoshop. I always make sure, well, I always, I try to make sure that I hide my light to save time. Um, if not, I try to put my light when there's no texture. So if I'm shooting a sunset, whenever there's no texture, so I can Photoshop that light easier because rebuilding texture is very hard. Let, if I had a light over there, what I would do, I would take two shots so I can actually just composite that light out to make my life easier. But he was right there aiming at the dress with a grid just to spotlight it. And like, you know, we said before, like you're a, what's considered a high volume shooter and you're doing a lot of weddings a year. So do you try to do most of what you're doing in camera and with your lighting and not do a ton in post or? Yes, I do. Photoshop. I actually work very slow throughout the day. And I do explain to my clients before that, I do believe in clear communication. So I'd say my work is this way because I work with lights. It takes a little bit sometimes. I know I don't move as fast as a photojournalistic. Uh, I would love to, <laughs> uh, but so I explain to them and I try to keep it efficient. Right. If I ha see something that needs to be fixed, I'm going to fix it right there and then, so I don't have to worry about it later. Any other questions before we move on to Blair, right back there? All wedding day. Wow. No, that's a good question. So, yeah. Oh. Can you re please repeat so everybody can hear you? <laughs> I'll repeat it. So. I'll repeat it. Yeah. So, he was asking me if my scenic shots are actually done on wedding day or non-wedding day because um, um, some of them are... They're, well, they seem like very, like, almost yeah. like big productions. Like, how are you doing <laughs> that on the wedding day? You know, some people will, like, go the next yeah. day or the day no, like those previous. Are all wedding day. On that time of the day, I move really fast. Courtney has worked with me many times. She'll say, I'm I actually kind of, let fast, fast, fast. Like we, we become, you know. But um, um, I, the people that are hiring me are hiring me for that. And they actually sometimes tell me, I don't care about anything as long as I can get one beautiful scenic shot. And that's when the very large prints come to place. Some people have asked me, like, why the little people on the big scene? Yeah, on Instagram it looks awful, you can't see the people. But actually, when you print a 40-inch or a 30-inch print, it looks amazing. Yeah. Anything else? And then, okay, back there, the man in the orange. Is this for Kevin? So how do you deal with the lighting when you're like the fly on a wall documentary, you're just do it, shooting as you go? Okay, so first of all, it's the United Kingdom, so there's never any light. <laughs> it's right. always miserable. It's always raining. Um, it's not, that's not so true. But um, yeah, so I don't, use, I don't use flash. I don't use any kind of um, supplementary light whatsoever. I will try and use available light. With, like, within an inch of my life, I will use as much available light as possible, which means that I'm always looking for the light. I'm always using that idea of light composition and moment. They're the three things that make up a good picture in my mind. And I will use spot metering in the camera to, you know, to really, tr really try and bring out the, the highlight areas of the image. You know, in, my, in the old days of shooting, I used to ride exposure compensation all the time. I would just I would fight against the light instead of work with the light. And I think if you, I don't know if you can see some of the images that back on the screen, Wait, but um, I'm actually using the light all the time um, as much as possible. I mean, that's outside, but, you know, there's one, I think, here in that case, for example, you know, this is, um, you know, I'm, I have to ch make a very quick decision at this point whether I move to the behind the groom to the left when his father's approaching him or I stay to the right hand side and I'm thinking in my head actually you know what if I go to the left I'm going to be riding exposure compensation I'm going to be fighting against the light if I go to the right which is a difficult shot to get because the groom is backing into the wall there I have to move in take the picture move away but first the first thing that's going through my mind is where is the light coming from the light is the most important thing um, you know and when you're working with natural light you have to constantly think about that constantly does that answer the question? Yeah. Good. All right, so we're going to move on to Blair, but then there'll be time if you have any questions after that. That was used for my text, so that's great. So, thank you, Kevin. Um, so, Blair, just tell us who you are and 
what you do. <laughs> so uh, I'm Blair DeLobbenfels. I'm in my 20th year in the photo industry um, in some pretty varied uh, positions. So I started in 1997 going to fine art school, went from there, became a portrait photographer for two years. I was very lucky with some local awards, so I was actually able to make money doing that after graduating from school. I went on, was a uh, wedding photographer for seven years, and um, was also lucky because of building community. So one of the things I did um, when we would have, in our very first clients, I shot a lot of weddings uh, for friends for free. I second shot, and I also went to four years of school um, before I started shooting. And you kind of had to do that back in the film days um, because you couldn't screw up, period. So you had to have that kind of confidence. And um, I would always write to people after they'd hired me, um, like sort of a little love letter about why I loved their wedding and what I loved about their family. And um, pretty soon we were just getting referrals like crazy and we had this really going business. And so we had, we'd get so, you know, like kind and personal with people that they would end up calling us and saying, hey, should I get the cake with the, you know, the pink roses or the other thing? And then they would have friends call us. So I looked at my um, friend Christy and I said, why don't we just start, like there's these things, blogs now. And so why don't we just start one and tell them who to hire? So we just were like, here's who you should hire in Seattle. Here's what's up. Here's our gold list. We're going to show some real weddings once a week. And people started calling us and going, who the heck are you guys? I'm getting way more work from you than I get from the knot, whatever. So boom, a business was born. And when Junebug Weddings started, everyone who worked there was a fine art trained photographer. And um, that was what separated us from every other blog in the world. Um, I don't know if they have any photographers on staff anymore. Um, I was happy to sell the business three and a half years ago. Um, and move on to some other things. But while I was there, when I, when I was almost finished, I was promoting 1,200 photographers in 27 countries in this best of the best list that I'd started and also the best of the best contest. And what I learned from working with all these wonderful people in this industry is that no matter how famous they were, no matter how much other people wanted to emulate them, most of them weren't making any money. It was just a facade. And so just recently, I, I was speaking at another conference in the UK, and there were 250 people in the room, and I asked everyone to raise their hand who had made over six figures last year. That was all of two people. Two people in the entire room. But this is going to get more so, positive, right? Yes, this is going to get... No, I just want to get, like, to the truth here, right? So I just... I'm not trying to bum I'm anyone just out. I just This is the truth, right? So when I see... What's going on in this industry, what I want to do is I help people make money. So that's what I do now. And the most important thing that you can do to make money is to pretend you're your own client. So that means you literally Google, like you pretend I am my ideal client. You are going to go to a search engine. You're going to use the search engine keywords that you think they would use, which are now going to become part of your website and SEO. Or you're going to look at your mobile experience. You're going to look at all of those pieces, and then you're going to look at what's my first impression on my website. Does my content match? Do, if I'm in the luxury market, do I have that tone? If I'm in a more whimsical thing, does the tone match the pictures? So all of those things have to happen because you truly have about 20 seconds to get someone to your website and about two minutes to keep them. So that's like everything happens within that piece. So today what I'm going to talk about is portfolio curation and why it's so important to take people on an emotional journey that really connects with them and makes them want to hire you before they've ever looked at your price sheet. So um, I will just kind of do this okay. when I want to go, okay. go so on to the next I. one. Just... So the number one thing that I see when somebody comes to me um, to work with them as a mentor is they frequently have too many images in their portfolio. And this happens a lot of time in about the three to five year mark when people have some stuff behind them, but they feel like they have to prove to their clients that their photos are good. So they start to like just stuff their portfolio with all of these images, but they're not all five star images. The second you have all five star images, that's all that you ever show. That's all you ever show. And as you get into the luxury market, less is actually more. So you'll notice that people make tons of money. They don't show much work. They just show killer work, 30 in the portfolio, end of story. When they blog, they only show the very best work. They don't show this, and you know, one in color, one in black and white, three of the cake cutting. They just show the best one. And so that is really, really important. 
And um, I really want to second the educational stuff that you guys have been talking about. If you have never, t there's so many great conferences, so many great people to learn from, so many workshops. But if you're going to do, if you're going to get educated, the most important thing you can do is take a black and white one class, a lighting class, and a marketing class. But what I see is a lot of people, um, black and white has uh, been lost as an art form. And um, when you see at the luxury level, when people get up there and they're charging $15,000, they know they're black and white. They, they just, they have to, because you can't, you cannot make money without knowing that and, and really say that you're an incredible photographer unless you have consistently beautiful black and white processing. But can I say one quick thing? I don't want to wreck your flow, but like one thing that really like upsets me as I, when we get our submissions, not upsets me, but I have a real pet peeve that we get a lot of like black and white images that aren't black and white at all. They're a gray. And there's this trend uh, that I've seen in the last few years of very like gray images that don't have that richness and contrast that you saw in like Mantis's work and in Kevin's work. Um, you know, what would you tell people about that? Because yeah. it did become a trend, but I don't understand it at there's all. Like the gray, people, black, and white. You know, like uh, Jonas Peterson for a while was doing some stuff that was grayscale, and it was really cool, and but it was also extremely complex. Um, so some of his stuff was working. For me, it is such an outlier to see a gray scale black and white photo that's worth it. Um, that, and, and you know, I, I got brought up on the zone system and some people, I, I think I'm probably the oldest person in the room, but some people might be close. And <laughs> yeah. zone system. So the zone system is a must for every photographer to understand. It really, really is because it not only tells you how to shoot black and white, it tells you how to shoot color and it tells you how to shoot light. So, um, that's an interesting okay. thing to look up if you're going, what the heck? Okay. Um, so, yeah, so keep it simple. And then you have to, from the very beginning, another thing I see a lot is um, photojournalism is a massive trend right now, and a lot of people are doing their portfolios in order to pre impress other photographers or win awards. So I can tell right away when I open up their portfolio, I'm like, holy cow, that was amazing, that was a such and such award, but that is not what the bride wants to look like. That's not what she wants her dad to look like, right? Like that's, get to that funny stuff later, show them your art chops later, but right. in the very beginning, get them to want to be in your photograph. Get them to fall in love with the photograph and say, if I could step into that picture, that's how I want to feel. So um, this is a photo for a guy I work with in the UK who just moved into the luxury market. So this has this very like, classy fashion vibe. This is the opening photo. We changed the first five images in his portfolio and he doubled his, his work in two months. And but people were just like, I love your work. They, know, they don't even get done looking at the portfolio. They're just like, wow, I want to be that. Okay, next one. Uh, this is Nessa Kay, you know, beautiful. Um, she's an amazing photographer, but this, you know, is again, this is a different kind of client. This isn't a luxury client. This is a destination client. It hits that note right away. Like, I want to feel like that. Okay. This one is Richard Israel. It's literally taken in a garage, right? So he had nothing else to do. These people just got married. There's like six people at this wedding. You know, how, what am I going to show from it? Well, this is his opening photo because he can show you that you, they can be happy as heck sitting in a garage, you know, <laughs> like, right? It's not the opening photo. I didn't have him put it on his website as that, but in a blog post. Right, because it's going to draw people in. They go, I want to feel that way. And then what you want to do before you um, have your going away shot, what you want to do is show, in the middle, you want to show your emotional stuff, the stuff that makes people laugh and cry. In the beginning, you want them to smile and go, oh, that's so beautiful, and I want to be that, and that looks so joyful. And then you want to take them on a journey of, I'm crying, I'm laughing, I want my friends to look like that, they've got gorgeous art images, and then at the end you actually want to wrap up with a bye-bye shot. And you can have two or three, but you want to take them there in about 40 images, tops, and just deliver them to the end of the thing. And by the time you get there, they've already, I mean, you know, there's a lot in psychology on sales right now that say people make decisions before they even know they do. And so this is how you get them to do it. So keep your processing consistent. Don't ever show a slightly sepia-toned photograph next to a black and white photograph. Or try to you know, use this filter and that filter and the other thing. The thing that makes you a distinctive artist is that all your work looks exactly the same and has the same voice. 
So like if I say to you, imagine a Picasso or imagine a Rembrandt, instantly stuff comes to your mind. They're never going to look like each other. Right? So that's what you want to find is it, that it really got to the point when I was at Jimbug, I had to tell people like you can't tell me who sent that shot and then who, in for the best of the best because I, if you tell me it's going to influence my decision, but then later I could tell who shot it without even knowing. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, dang it. Okay, now I'm going to take me out of the first round of this because I could just tell, but it was because they were that good. So you just want to, like, here's, here's Richard's processing is, is this very romantic look. And, go on. and here's Nessa again with, uh, and she's got her own uh, filter on develop uh, because she has a very distinctive look. Uh, Fabio, uh, beautiful um, black and white rendering uh, of, a, of a high key shot. And what I see a lot of times in this, the, the, um, the fabric would be missed missing, they would blow it out. So many people would blow that out. Right. Okay, next. It's a beautiful image. Uh, here, Allison Calloway, just a gorgeous capture, gorgeous black and white capture. Again, speaking to the luxury market, which she's in, right? So she's like, she's showing people, this is how you're going to look. This is how you're going to feel. Right, and those brides, they want like to show their dress off and see how beautiful, you know, and, like the light and the detail and the, right. and the and dress. Right, and she works with high-end celebrity right. clients in, Lo in Los Angeles. And they and they this woman probably spent several tens of thousands of dollars on her dress, so it needs not to be missed. So then, as a lot of people have talked about, and all you guys have been talking about that is how do you curate for your ideal client? And uh, a lot of people at first are like, I just want any client. Um, I think that's a mistake. I think entering the market without be, knowing your craft really well so you can turn it into an art. So what I see for new photographers is there's such a low barrier to entry. They can just start shooting without second shooting, without learning, go out and start shooting. They develop a brand that's not going to help them. And then they feel like they have to take every um, thing that comes their way. So they start charging like $1,200, which brings the entire industry down. So just like anything else, if you're going to be an electrician, you're going to be, whatever you do, you should take it very seriously and not start shooting until you're solidly qualified to charge the money that the industry charges. It's just so important. I see it happening in Seattle. They're so oversaturated. The photographers up there can't get more than three grand for a wedding. And it is tragic. It's just like, it's just a race to the bottom. So here's Anna Kim. She threw, shoots 350 weddings out of her studio in Maui. Wow. Um, and this is what she shows, because that's all she does. She does beach elopements, beach weddings. And so this is what she's going to show as an opening photo. So you right away know, oh, it's going to be totally relaxed. We're going to be on the wedding, you know, on the beach. This is what's going to happen. Uh, Marissa Cleveland, who does a lot of LGBTQ um, weddings. And so this is a great opening photo to say I'm, I'm catering to that market. Or again, Allison, um, catering to the luxury market. So a lot of people have talked about being true to your own style, but it is absolutely the only way that you'll ever survive in the market long term is by having that distinctive style that people eventually can get to and say, wow, that, that's them, and that's really different. But to wait, Blair, let me ask you quickly, because yeah. I say that all the time about the distinct style, but then like, think about how many wedding photographers there are in the, it's like an oversaturated market. And yes, they have the distinct style, but you know, at what point do you say that they, then you got you have to do more than that, right? So oh gosh, then, you it, have to do so much. right? You have to do so much. So this is just a tiny, tiny piece. Um, there's actually an article in Rangefinder this month that I wrote about portfolio curation. But for me, when I'm working with clients, this is like step five, <laughs> right? So there's there's a whole, but really every time I work with a client, I'm just like, okay, tell me who your ideal client is. If you don't know, then we're going to find it. And now we're going to pretend that we're them. And we're just going to go through it all the way to sale. So I don't tell people, show me your website. I say, show me your responses to clients. Show me your price sheet. Show me when you didn't get a booking. Why did that happen? So there's all these different pieces. But, you know, and you guys can ask about that. So I, yeah. I won't be much longer. And Sorry. you can ask about any question that you want. So, um, yeah, this is just part of the... Uh, what just came out um, in Rangefinder, but I love Pedro Toro's vibe. It's, you know, you look at it and it's like, oh, this has really got this strong retro. It's like the, the, and everything of his is strong. The images are really strong compositionally. They're, they, all the color looks like that, deeply saturated, but not 
like crazy. I mean, it's a little bit too oh, saturated sorry. on the screen here. Um, okay, go ahead. And Morgan Lynn Rossi um, is, you know, very much involved in the Fearless group, um, does this gorgeous black and white stuff that's just really emotive and in the moment. I mean, that's a great opening shot for her portfolio. Jeff Newsom, who just sees in an Sorry. entirely different way than I've ever seen anyone. And so the way he shoots, he hardly has to do any marketing at all because nobody else shoots like him. So that's, I mean, he just he mainly shoots for other photographers because they're like, wow, dude, you just blow my mind. And so he mainly shoots for other photographers. So what do you mean by that? Like he obviously like, you know, how's yeah, he making money? he constantly money? does. <laughs> reflections, um, shooting through things, using lighting out in the dark. Like if somebody said to him, it's pitch dark, it's midnight, and we forgot our group shot, he's going to do all kinds of stuff with like flashlights, little teeny, like little lights that he's had, and he's going to create the light around them. Like he'll do multiple exposures and literally, you know, do the coolest group shots in the pitch dark just by setting off the flash and doing, you know, like 12 exposures in, right behind everyone or in front of everyone. And so he does a lot, but he's, he um, is, um, went to school um, in math, and so he has a very mathematical mind, so a lot of his stuff is about, you know, what could you do if you tried this sort of scientific experiment <laughs> with it? And it turns out really amazing. I know he is one of the most unique styles I've ever seen. I really love his work a lot. Ever. And um, I mean, there's Elizabeth Messina who started her own thing. There's people that you know when you look at it, you go, oh, yeah, I, I, I know who took that. This is Fair uh, Worsty. He has a really strong style. He tries things like this a lot of time from angles that you wouldn't have expected. When he first started, um, he was doing the shots where you, know, you just see the hands and the bouquets are up in the air. Um, he started to shoot just little pieces of things and sort of disorient you into where's the ground? Um, you know, what's, what direction are we looking at? Like, how do, you know, are we, is that in a mirror or it's not? Um, so he also does a lot of really interesting things with composition. Um, his his uh, color is, it, it's like that all the time. There's nothing, I mean, it's, the processing in all of these um, examples are very cohesive. I think that's the end of your slides. That's the end of it, yours. Uh, I think there might be one more. Uh, I just, I have, this is my thing, so. Okay, cool. But cool. thank you so much, Blair. And um, just quickly, because Kevin actually has to run off to the airport in a few <laughs> minutes. It's, we have about, um, I think, oh, about 10 minutes left. But if anyone wants to ask Kevin specifically first, because he does have to leave a little bit early. So anybody, like, another question for Kevin? Anything about shooting documentary weddings and photojournalistic style, nothing? What do you do if they're not emotive? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, some people, <laughs> actually lots of photographers say to me, what happens when nothing happens? Uh -uh. Um, and, and my answer is that it's always happening. There's always stuff. Um, for example, I will concentrate a lot at trying to get those very first moments, like when the, um, the bride and groom, when the bride walks down the aisle, and the very first time they just kind of touch their fingers together, you know, it's some, something that nobody else will see but the photographer at the front. And if you know it's going to happen, because it always happens, the first time they touch each other on their wedding day, that sounds terrible, but you know what I mean. Um, you know, and it, the first time they glance at each other, the first time that all of these things that happen, that they don't have to be beaming with smiles for these to be, you know, personal moments in their in their personal history, that kind of thing. It's always happening. And if things are getting really, really bad in terms of um, the environment, some, you know, we've all been to weddings where people just kind of sit at the bar and just drink and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. then you start looking for humor. And you know, I, did, I once did a wedding where um, it was a, a literally, it was a beautiful golf course and 30 people, and they were all just sat around the bar for about four hours, didn't do anything. So I took a whole series of pictures of their feet and their shoes. Um, there was women with um, like uh, tights that were scagged. There was uh, two guys with odd shoes on. There was price stickers on the bottom of the shoes, etc. <laughs> so you know, it was just filling the gap, and you know, you just start looking for things, and you just add humour into stuff. Um, and to, to kind of take that forward a little bit further, I think I help myself by giving myself a theme. So if I'm really struggling for something to look for, I'll always think, right, have I answered the five Ws: who, why, what, where, and when? 
and then, you know, I can think, right, have I, have I dealt with the weather? Have I dealt, I've got to tell a story about the environment, who's here, why are they here, what's going on, where, when, all of that kind of stuff. And if I'm still struggling, then I'll start thinking, okay, now I'm going to give myself a theme, and the theme might be uh, the color red, or it might be kids, or it might be people on their mobile phones, Wh whatever, it doesn't matter. But as soon as you have a theme, you start looking for things. And, you know, I'm a big believer that you, you know, anybody can press the button on a camera, anybody can be that photographer, but only you can observe what you want to see. And they come to you, the clients come to you because what you see, not, of you, not because of your ability to press the button on the camera. So, you know, I think that by, you know, when you start looking for something, you slow down, you shoot a lot less. Things at weddings happen, even if nothing's happening, there's always something happening. Right. Because like Joe Busink, who I'm sure a lot of people know, um, and he, you know, did a lot of that fly on the wall, more candid photojournalistic style, would always say it's, it's those in-between moments that you should be capturing. Like, you know, that nobody is seeing and like you're getting the, in, like when the bride is with her father, um, and every, I always see like the tear rolling down the father's face or the tear rolling down the bride's face. But what about what's happening right, like one minute before that or one minute after that? Because you also need to like anticipate what's going to happen next. I mean, that's also I think really important, especially uh, doing like the type of wedding photography that Kevin does. Don't you feel like you're always sort of, you know, just trying to anticipate what's coming next, even though you're still doing like more, can it's very like candid. Yeah, you, you, anticipation is key. You know, you have to, I mean, weddings are very formulaic. You pretty much know when things are going to happen in terms of the order of the day. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you're listening, you're watching, you're, tr you're understanding who the characters are. You know, if there's something, somebody's telling a joke in that far corner, you, you'll get ready for it. You know, you'll, you'll deal with all of that stuff. Um, but yeah, you kind of, you just think on your feet and by giving yourself opportunity to look for things rather than just constantly worrying about taking pictures, then you just see more, you see more, you observe more. Yeah. Thank you. So um, any questions for any of the panel here, for me, anybody else who wants to chime in? No? Um, I'll just show my last slide. So this can apply to any sort of competition or contest or just using these to help guide you if you're you know, going to submit work to a blog or to a magazine or just uh, work on your portfolio. And again, this is what we keep saying over and over, to cultivate a consistent look that's yours and yours alone. I mean, it could be anything you want it to be, but just, you know, inject your own, like, brand and your voice. Um, you know, and again, be inspired by other photographers' work, but try not to, like, don't do exactly what they're doing, just get inspiration from it. And then, you know, who was it? Like Simon Cowell on American Idol, like years ago, make it your own, just make it your own. Um, because then people will really believe, you know, if you believe it, they believe it. Um, include variety and diversity in your portfolio, especially with the submissions, because if, you know, it's just all bride and groom, bride and groom, I don't know that you can shoot anything else at a wedding. You know, I want to see the getting ready shots and the details, um, or like the ring bearer. A lot of times I think, oh, this has to be an elopement, because there's only two people in every single image. But there's so much more to the wedding day. And a lot of photographers, like in the last few years, when I started, nobody did first looks. I didn't even know what that was. Or, you know, everybody does the first looks now. Or um, Mantis does a lot of elopement. Uh, not elopement, I'm sorry. A lot of engagement photography. Like, there's so much you can be doing beyond just the wedding day. Um, and I'll just, like, diversify your portfolio while still maintaining that cohesive look. Um, isn't it true as well, sometimes you see portfolios and they're all couple shots, and then you see some portfolios where there's none. Right, like which it's is just, like, wait, who got married like there's here? there's none. And, and you never see the, t the couple's face. Right, never. <laughs> I think that's really fascinating, well, and it's also too. what you were saying before, like, like, okay, I've never been married, but if I was a bride with images, I don't want it to see, like, the back of my head in a really tiny, like, I'm really small. Like, you know, yeah. like, you want to see, like, I would want to see myself in my beautiful dress. And, like, yeah. you can be artistic, but what Blair was talking about before is a lot of those shots are, are for competition and not as much as for your clients. Like, so you could, almost, you could have two books, I would say, maybe, not two websites, but, you know, I know a lot of photographers who uh, the images they submit for competition 
are more like they really work on those and they're for competition more than like they're not going to show those same images on their website for their brides. Don't you feel that way? Yeah, and a lot of times I find with, with photojournalists that are strictly photojournalists, when I get phone calls when people are in tears, it's because their clients are upset. And usually the reason they're upset is because they're like, well, wait a minute, he never got a full-length picture of my, dra my dress. He didn't take a picture with my mom and dad, or he or she, whatever. And then you're like, and then the photojournalist is saying, why are they upset about it? I was so clear that I don't do that. Right. But it doesn't matter how clear you get, because then when they get the photos, like, where is it? Right. Or like Kevin, if somebody, yeah. if a bride handed you a shot list, wouldn't you just laugh in their face because that's not what you do no 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 so well, you wouldn't what laugh a, in their face I, <laughs> yeah, no. I uh remember my wife tells me i'm miserable so um <laughs> no no what i will do is talk to them and you know i will kind of say look you know this isn't really going to be the right way to do things because i don't have the ability to do these things for you you can either have me for my ability my, my kind of skill as a photojournalist but the longer we're doing any kind of formal stuff you're not going to get that so you know, I'll talk to them about it, and on, on several occasions we've kind of agreed, uh, you know, I've returned deposits and just gone, you know what, you need to go to my friend down the road who will be able to give you what you want. I can't do that. It's right. much better to, uh, to hand them over to photographers that will be able to do that than, than you know, both of you struggle on the day. Well, I'm because so you glad will end you said that. Also like because that. I know a lot of photographers who will do that or say, you know, I don't, I don't do that type of photography, but my friend does. Let me like refer him or her. Mm -hmm. And also, I know a lot of photographers, I think I might have done this in the past, but if you can't shoot the wedding and you're not available, then you do like say that I know such and such in that city. Like everybody's very supportive of each other and like helps each other out. Like you're competitive, but you're also like, we're all in the same community. Um, so on that note, I know we only have a few minutes left. If there are no other questions, no? Okay. Yes, right over here. So you're saying when you're submitting to a blog, what do you, how do you know, like how to submit the right work? Is, or is that what you're saying? Like to catch a photo editor's eye? Uh, on that particular blog or a uh, magazine, do you want to answer that, Blair? Because it's true, you have to know, like, do the research of what type of images do those blogs or magazines look for? Because it's very different from blog to blog, mag magazine to magazine. So um, it is not important that you be published or on blogs if you're a certain kind of photographer. So what I think is awesome about this panel is they're all three really different. Oh, yeah. Where they got their work from is really different. How they shoot is really different. So, I mean, that's the wonder of art, right, is you get to do your own thing, and you get to not only do your own thing in terms of your distinctive voice, but you also get to take the path that you want to take. Um, so when people do want to get, the first thing I ask them when they are like, I want to get published, I want to get on blogs, the first question I ask is why, right? So this, is this relevant to your particular business, the kind of, the, the ideal client that you want? Um, for the blogs that exist today, um, you know, they're still holding on to the overexposed look, the pastel -y, um, you know, people are running through the field. I mean, we've had, there's been a trend that's um, going on five or six years old right now that's still pretty much um, ruling the blogs. There's a little bit of film stuff coming in. But what you have to have, and this is what I feel so sad to have to say, you can't get published without details. You can't. There, nobody will publish you. So if you, if you have a great wedding and you're a photojournalist and let's say you're working for a celebrity or the couple's just amazing and the, you know, it's a destination thing or it's something that's really going to push what you want to, to show to your ideal client and you don't shoot details, then take a second shooter because there's just no way you'll get published. Because the blogs want 50% details in your submission. They usually want 50 to 100 images. They want 50% details. You have to have at least seven scenarios in detail. So that means like invitation, cake, dress. They really want to see the invitations, which is weird. So a lot of people who get published all the time, they have all the paperwork sent to their house beforehand and actually shoot the invitations before they get there in this very sort of editor editorial way. They want all the, um, the details shot in the same lighting. So because they're going to put it in a grid, right? Or they're going to lay it out inside of a magazine. So. 
for the most part, they want it in the same lighting, unless you really nail the reception and it's another set of lighting, and then all of the stuff from the reception is that kind of lighting, and then the stuff from the rest of the day. But they're, they're thinking grids is what they're thinking. They want a great opening shot, like I was showing them for the portfolio of the couple, smiling, really engaged. They want that because they're going to have a lead photo of a couple. And a lot of times that lead photo is going to be vertical. And so what's happening in the photojournalism world is a lot of people are only shooting horizontals. If you send 100 horizontal images to a blog, they have no idea what to do with you. So they, they want vertical portraits. And um, they want like that happy moment. And then they want a great bridal party shot that shows all the fashions that are being worn. And then anything that would be search term, because what they're looking for is to tag that for search terms so brides will come to their site. So if somebody's wearing Christian Louboutin shoes or they have a Monique Lulier dress, they want you to nail that detail so that then they can tag it for that coveted item that gets searched for and then people come to their blog. So it's really um, a whole way of shooting. And there, there are some people who just shoot, like Elizabeth Messina shot way back in the day for Martha Stewart, and then a lot of people have come along since then and started shooting for Style Me Pretty, but they have that formula and they always deliver all of that stuff, right? So the bloggers don't even look at anything else because they're like, well, this photographer gets my deal, right? And they're sending me everything I want, so they'll become my favorites. And they don't even have to submit anymore because I'm going to reach out to them and ask them. So you see how a lot of the blogs, they're just ruled by a few photographers that just get on them over and over and over again. So I would say that if that's your style and you're willing to do that and you really have a reason to get published, um, then you have to go that route. But, I'm not, but I don't want to discourage you because you don't have to go that route. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. okay, well, on that note, we have to end, and Kevin has to catch his plane, but I, I really want to thank uh, the panelists. Thank you, Mantis, Cami, Kevin, and Blair. I mean, I really am so grateful that they've lent their voices here and shared their insight and expertise. And um, if anyone, I love getting emails and seeing people's work and portfolios, so if you want to email me, jacqueline.tobin at emeraldexpo.com. I answer every email, it might take a few days, but I do answer every email and I really want to see your work and if you have questions, just send them to me and even questions for them and I can pass along. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. <laughs>